Yep. All right, we're good. Okay, so let me introduce myself first. Um, my name is Daniel Jeffrey. I work for the Linux Foundation. Um, I've gravitated to regulated environments, I guess. I've, I've worked in the financial sector, in banks. I've worked in retail, PCI environments. I've had to build FedRAMP and FISMA environments. And uh, yeah, I see, yeah, I'm with you. And then uh, uh, more recently, I've had experience dealing with web trust and some of the regulations that circulate there. So regulated environments have been uh, the place that I've, I've wandered. And I've done that both in startups and then in well-established companies. And as I was preparing um, this talk, this actually grew out of a talk that I gave last fall. Um, and I, I, I thought, you know what, there's a lot that regulation requires that really is just being smart. Um, and when it comes to startups, we can apply many of those things without adding a significant and onerous overhead. I think most of the time when people think about adding security to their startup, it sounds like, oh no, we're gonna make things really heavy and hard and slow. And so this is actually talking about some of the things that may sound scary um, that I think we can implement in a more reasonable way. So <clears throat> to get us started, Oh, we're going to wake up. There we go. So we're going to use a hypothetical startup and founder to illustrate some of what we're talking about. We'll give them some parameters and then we'll make some decisions about how they're going to resolve, how they're going to implement some of the things we got. So uh, being as we're in Utah, our startup, come on, there we go. Senator Hatch, at least as a constituent of Hatch, I get regular emails explaining how he has done everything you could ever want in order to help technology. So we're going to have Senator Hatch start up cyber as a service. He's got a cyber API so that everybody can get their cyber. And that's going to be our startup that we're going to work with here. Um, so I said a little bit of this already, but the security processes that are implemented in m many of the things that are implemented in most regulatory schemes are actually just common sense. They're best practice things that you ought to be doing anyway. And one of the things that startups have to realize, I've had many startups tell me, or even, even a bank that I worked with at one point, oh, we're not really at risk because we're super small, right? And as security people, I think most of the people in this room are aware that that's ridiculous. Most attacks are opportunistic. You have, sure, the large targeted attacks that get a lot of press, but most of the attacking that happens is somebody who knows how to do this one thing or a couple of tricks that they've got, and they look for people that are vulnerable. And when they find a target, they go in. So attacks are opportunistic. Size doesn't matter. If you're on the web, you're accessible. So, and you know, if you lose that trust, especially as a startup where you're struggling against others, it can be very difficult to recover. And adding security later, doing the, oh, we'll get to that when we're bigger, is a huge expense in most cases. If you take the time to think about your security and your infrastructure in the first place, you can save yourself a tremendous amount of time, money, and pain later. Because often, there's significant overhaul required once you've come to rely on it. So, today, for our <coughs> hypothetical startup, Hatches Cybersecurity as a Service, um, we're going to talk about four different categories um, that I've drawn from regs. There are many other things that we could look at, but we're going to talk about system patching, frequency and automation. We're going to talk about monitoring and centralized logging, specifically from a security standpoint. And we're going to talk about configuration management, code review, and change control. And we're going to talk about separation of duties. We're going to talk a little bit about why we want to do these things, why it's worth spending a little bit of your very precious startup capital and human resources to put these things in place. And we're also going to, I'm going to give a few suggestions on ways that we can achieve those things. Now, I'm standing up here. I'm the one with the mic on. But especially as we get to the suggestions on how we can do these things, I would be very open to having members of the audience who have experience with that raise a hand and say, hey, here's another way we've done that. Or, hey, here's something else I've seen done that can help achieve this goal. So 
Think of this as interactive. We can do Q&A at the end, but if you guys have something you want to pitch in, the intention of this is let's learn from it. So um, I think we all know that no matter how long you've been in this industry, there's somebody else that knows a trick you don't. So, and I am by no means the savant at the top of the ladder. So the overview of our little company that we're dealing with here, we have our cyber API that must be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's relied on by other businesses so that they have adequate cyber in order to service their customers. Hatch has in his company currently four developers, four operations staff. The operations staff is also functioning as the security staff at this point. That role is crossing between operations and, and developers. We want to make sure the developers are also security conscious. And then we have five marketing and sales staff that we try and keep on the other side of the room. And then three people doing finance and HR jobs. Um, so, you know, we're really, really small, lean, trying to get our feet on the ground, take off with this company. Um, at this point, we're going to assume that Hatch is going fully modern and they're not doing anything with uh, hardware in a DC. So we will talk a little bit about dealing with hardware issues, but we're going to assume cloud. Um, so the ops context as we move on to talking about patching now. Patching dread is a very real thing among operations people. Um, patching can and does break production environments. When you talk about patching to an ops person, any multi-year ops veteran will have multiple stories to be able to tell to management about why they should not do this patching. Because bad things. And they're, they're real stories. It happens. Patching can totally destroy the environment if the wrong thing happens that when you dig into putting on the latest of whatever it is that somebody's deployed for you. So the conclusion that many uh, organizations I've worked with and many more that I've heard stories from come to is often you stock up on the Red Bull and then you patch once a year when Hatch is going to be out of town. So you figure out, you know, when he's going to be taking that vacation in the mountains and he won't have his cell phone, and you got 24 hours to fix whatever happens. This is not an ideal solution, right? So we talk about patching frequently. The reason to patch frequently is because patching is your simplest and most effective way to be protected from existing problems, right? There's always the threats that we don't know about yet. But you can be protected from stuff we do know about if you patch. Now, the, we talk about, I use the term frequent patching, and frequent patching is, I think, critical because the more often you do it, the less likely you are to run into the hypothetical nuclear wasteland patch scenario where everything blew up. That can still happen. I mean, I have, from my own experience, I remember when uh, we patched, we were, I was in an environment that was a mixed Linux Windows environment, and we were running Samba. And we got a Samba patch that they, the developers had realized that there was a serious um, uh, escape from their sandboxed area possible if Simlinks were, were enabled. And so they just decided in that next release that they were going to add a new parameter and set it to, and set Simlinks to disabled by default. So this entire service that the organization relied on, their file system, like half of people's files didn't work anymore after the patch because they'd been Simlinked in order to not have lots of duplication of particular structures. And now they were gone. That was a fun thing to troubleshoot in the first place because you don't know what happened unless you, have, unless you read the patch notes for absolutely every single thing you upgraded, which in a startup, you got time for that? You're patching and you're trying to get on to the other thing you've got to do. And so you've now got to figure out, okay, what happened? I think this happened because of the patch we did last night, but... 
it's a challenge. So frequency and doing it regularly, though, means that there was only the one problem to fix. There was this one thing that went weird instead of having 30 different things that had all accumulated over the six months to a year since I did my last patches. Um, okay. So on the patching section, this is the strategies component, right? These are ways that we, these are some methods, got a couple slides here talking about ways to approach patching. The method that I was using in the scenario with Samba was we decided on a cadence that we were gonna do it at, and then we just did it periodically, right? With the just do it approach, it's, it always feels like a time sink because you have to be engaged. You've gotta be there. You don't have, you, it's pulling you away from everything else you're doing, so you jump in, you do it. It's going to get delayed because other stuff's going to be happening. You're saying, I don't have time for that right now. And when it eventually happens, it won't be as frequent as you wanted it to be. However, the team that's doing the updating is going to be there because it's manual. You're going to be eyes on when it happens. And you have the opportunity, at least, to vet every item individually. Now, it's not necessarily a dedicated part of this particular strategy, but most of the time with this particular strategy, testing and preparation kind of goes out the window. There will be less staging effort because they know they're going to be there. So groups tend to default back to, well, I'll just do it and I'll watch it because they know they're going to be there anyway and it takes extra time if they do it beforehand. The next strategy that I threw up here um, is a more modern strategy that I've seen a few places trying to implement. It's ephemeralizing everything. You identify all the instances that can be stateless, design things to be as stateless as possible, and then just get rid of them on a regular basis. Don't update them, make a new one. So you put a new one in place, and for this to work well, you gotta make sure that you have that prod-like environment to test them in before you put them out there, or else you're gonna have surprises. Um, you've got to make sure that, well, and you struggle with stateful components like databases um, or other pieces that somebody designed the software so that it leaves bits and pieces of itself around on the OS and you have to retain those and roll them forward onto the next instance. That becomes very complicated if it wasn't designed well in the first place. Um, I mean, you talk about databases, you've got a lot of different kinds of databases. You've got your authentication databases. You've also got retention servers like log servers. You can't just, you, there are ways to do it with log servers, but you still have to have the data stay somewhere and it has to tolerate that update without disappearing. Um, this type of a solution is most feasible in a cloud environment, definitely a virtualization environment. I have known people that have done it on hardware and I have a tremendous amount of respect <laughs> for the level of effort and thought that went into making an ephemeral type setup work on hardware. Um, but the redundancy that you have here does allow you a clean cutover because you're bringing up completely new things and you can cut over and still have the, the old thing to cut back to if it fails. So again, if anybody has experience with some of these that you want to chime in on, feel free. Okay, so then another option. No, on most um, desktops nowadays, you expect automated unattended updates. It's just gonna update itself. And that's a good thing. Um, it still can be frustrating at times when things break, but on a desktop, it's not as, doesn't affect as many people unless it hits everybody's desktop at the same time and you've gotta roll that back or fix it in a corporate environment. Um, but doing it on servers is scary. And so, but, 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 right? Doing it on servers is scary, but if you do it, you have a guarantee that, hey, we can keep things up to date and it can happen on an automated schedule. So how do you do it safely? How do you do automated patching on servers safely? Um, one strategy that I've seen done and have observed and had really good experience with personally was actually having a truly production-like staging environment right down to the hardware 
and well, if it's hardware, if it's a cloud environment, it's even easier, but have something that really, really honestly replicates production and hasn't had people fiddling around in it and making manual changes, but has to be forced to maintain the same configuration as production and manual changes get overwritten on a regular basis if there are any for testing purposes. So this staging environment is not a development environment. It's an environment where you may have to test things that are coming from development to make sure they're really ready for production because the development environment isn't truly production-like. Close as you can, but it doesn't have the same hardware investment. The staging environment needs to be production-like and clean. If you have an environment like that, then you can trust that if I do updates here and I'm monitoring it like I do my production environment, and I give it some period of time and I'm hitting it with traffic like I do my production environment, then I can feel a reasonable degree of confidence that after a few days running there, I can roll those same patches into my production environment and I'm not gonna see it break it. So you can put it on an automated schedule with monitoring in place that says, here it's running, it's looking good, I didn't have problems, so when it hits here, I can feel comfortable, I'm also not gonna have problems and it can happen on a regular cadence. Say once a week, you update staging, and three days later, you update your production environment. And then you pull down more patches, update staging again. A few days later, you update your production environment. That's the method that I would push people toward. In, and if you can do it in conjunction with an ephemeral method, I think the ephemeral method is the most awesome because you get somebody with, an APT that they got onto your system, somebody who's got themselves a nice little back door where they're exfiltrating whatever they want, but you blow that box away and bring a new one up, it doesn't matter. Um, so ephemeral where you can, but you can't, it's really hard to ephemeralize databases. Yeah. Mm hmm Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, and and containers are you know, really the easiest way to achieve ephemeralization. And um, you can, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons I didn't mention containers yet, but containers are the easiest way. Containers have their own sets of problems that are definitely improving. But you know, the last time we did a major container evaluation, we realized that we had serious issues achieving the kinds of firewall and logging capabilities we wanted. And those have improved significantly since then and continue, just continue to improve. But you have to evaluate whether or not this gives you everything you want with a container. But for ephemeralization purposes, containers are great. You can prep up a new one that has everything you want loaded on it and just bring it online and blow the old one away once you're comfortable with it. Containers are good that way. So I appreciate you bringing that up. And the segregation that's possible is also really nice. All right. So let's look at... So the last point I wanted to make here, um, does anybody have any other strategies they think I missed that would be good ones to bring up in talking about patch management? Okay. The last thing then is you want to design the software. So we're, we, in this case, we are... You, you, we can talk about the infrastructure and we can talk about the software. And since we are a uh, web API as a service, basically, in our little hypothetical company here, we're going to say that Hatch's development team and his operations team need to work together to design software that is, that is built with the intention of being patched cleanly and regularly. Um, that's more and more common nowadays as developers want to move toward continuous integration and be all kinds of agile and fast, um, but it's something that's critical to think about where the rest of the infrastructure is concerned as well, You're, and add from the get-go. Okay. 
Okay, so patching hardware. Patching hardware sucks. I mean, I don't think that there is... If anybody wants to disagree with me, I'd love to hear what you're doing. But patching hardware sucks, in my experience. There are solutions that are available for... Usually, they're more expensive, enterprise-oriented products that allow you to do some kind of synchronization across that vendor's particular suite of hardware products to maintain patches. But those solutions are really hard to justify in a startup environment. Um, they are onerous, expensive, and require somebody who's spending a fair amount of time maintaining them a lot of times. Um, some of them aren't. Some of them are pretty slick, but they're still expensive. Um, so with hardware, it really goes back to the just do it option is about all there is. And you've got to get yourself a cadence and you've got to commit to doing it. The other thing you have to do even more so with the hardware um, is make sure you're staying on top of and you're watching alerts. You need them with the software as well. But if you've got a really regular cadence that's like a week, you're not going to be as stressed about new vulnerabilities that come out with software because you'll be remediating them about as quick as they come out with the patches to remediate them with. And whereas with hardware, because you're going to be on a slower cadence, you've got to be aware that, oh, something critical happened and make sure that you're subscribed and watching what is coming in for the specific components that you run. Um, Rancid is the tool that I like. I don't know if all of you have heard of it or not, but Rancid is a tool that um, helps with keeping track of what's going on with logs, especially on network devices. Not logs, but configurations. And it helps you to track for changes and modifications that might be being made there. And have a backup of them so that when you do that update and it hoses stuff, you have an ability to say, okay, this is what my config was before the update and see how things differ or what you can do to fix it. I didn't get any takers on the I've got a magical solution for patching hardware, did I? It, I'm, I'm open to anything. If you've got some piece of hardware that you found is easy to patch, tell us about it. So you're talking about patching what specifically? Okay, so with, UC, with UCS, you're using um, Cisco's, you've set up their management component somewhere in the environment in order to talk to each of those boxes. How well do you think that scales for a 20-person company? The level of investment to get to that point. I haven't done it. I have not had a lot of experience with UCS, so I'm asking you. Right? So there is, a, I, I, I've never looked at the UCS um, management tool. There's an expense for that as well then, right? Okay. Um, but it is a slick tool. I've seen several others. I've used some with Dell hardware. I've used some with HP hardware as well. And there are ways to do it that are, they've designed, but they have cost and there's both in terms of, of money to buy it and then in terms of time to set it up and maintain it. That makes sense as you get to scale. As you get to hundreds of units, it's a great idea. Um, okay, so uh, just to retouch automation briefly, um, automation is, I need to speed up a little bit. Okay, automation is how we fix human error. That's why we do automation, um, and, is, and we need to think about that in terms of patching. If patching is all manual, then every time we try and patch, we're looking at humans to screw something up. The better way to do it is to script it, fix our scripts, and we get consistent result over and over again. We put a process in place, we obey the process, and then we have something we can fix. We can't fix, Joe decided to do patches this week, and he did it different than last time, and so we got different results. The other thing, we'll talk a little bit more with monitoring, but automated testing, so that we have consistent repeatability, of does my stuff work when I'm done with patching. Um, so let's talk about our sample company really briefly. So what they did here is they decided we're gonna build a full production parallel staging environment. And we're gonna generate load against it. We've got, we've, as part of the development of our API, 
we've decided we've developed a load generation tool as well so that we can make sure we hit it just like we expect customers to and that tool is going to take tuning over time as you observe that customers don't use it the way you thought they would and that they come up with creative ways of doing really things that you thought nobody would be stupid enough to do with your API and so you've got to adapt and make sure that you generate those cases as well at least on some schedule to make sure that the thing still works the way you expect it. That's good just for testing the software, but it tests your, up, it tests your updates to the environment as well. It's good to include things like checking that um, your DNS service and your, and your authentication service are still working as well after the update. Things that normally wouldn't get checked until one of you logged in and realized, oh, I can't do what I was supposed to do. Identify what services you offer in your environment and check those services. So they've done that, and they said, all right, and we're also going to automate our patching so that we do staging, and then we deploy to prod, because I think that's cool, so that's what I had them do. Um, and then they're using the clouds, so they don't have hardware to patch, but they're providing a redundant service across multiple locations, and that, this gives them the opportunity, since they're in a couple of different cloud locations, to bring one up and then bring up another, so they can rotate through their patches so that their service is never down because they're distributed across multiple sites. Um, and then they put monitoring in place to make sure that they're testing, which they're doing continuously rather than even just after they're um, patching. They'll get alerts on it and go, oh, hey, we have a problem and we can fix it. So again, if we build in patching planning from day one, you get used to it, it's normal, it's not painful because you've got a pattern and you've got a way to deal with it. So when we talk about monitoring and centralized logging, most of the time some kind of service performance monitoring is going to get in place pretty quick because the developers and the management want to know, is my stuff working? Is it doing what I expect it to do? How much volume are we getting through? Did we sell all those new contracts and look at all the people that are using the service? Those type of metrics usually get in place pretty quick. But the metrics that we need for security are often neglected. And those metrics are not that hard to put in alongside at the same time if we plan on it. Um, centralized logging is overlooked in a shocking number of cases. Centralized logging to me seems like a complete no-brainer. But the number of companies that I've worked at or with that still had all the logs just sitting on individual servers instead of pulling them in somewhere where they were easy to access, easy to scrape, easy to alert on, is crazy to me. And the maxim here is, again, we want to prevent, we want to configure our stuff for defense in depth and stop the things from getting attacked, but we got to make sure we can see it when it happens. So with centralized logging, if you plan for it from the beginning, you, it's easier for you to say in the first place, when I'm spinning up these boxes, I want them to log to here and here, and these are the different kinds of information that goes to each location. You do it while you're setting it up, so that you can say right off the bat, I'm getting logs from all these spots, and each of these spots I can say, this has debug information in it, so I need to turn the log down a little bit, or I just have a syslog filter on it, and say, I want these this level to go to this log that I can then share with the developers, and I want this level to go over to this log that I can make sure isn't shared unless we sanitize it. And then think, plan from the get-go. In a startup environment, you need collaboration. You need a team that's working together. The operations and the development and the management all need visibility and ability to collaborate, and logs are a big part of that. Developers, especially on their own software, wrote those logs so that they can figure out what it's doing. And in order to get that information, you want to make sure that you've aggregated it in a way that they can get access to it and collaborate with you. Um, all, one other, from a security standpoint, by centralizing the logs, they're harder for an attacker to get to. There are ways that they can alter, but you can also identify on non-reception. Hey, we're not getting logs from a host because somebody shut them off and I realized that's a problem we need to look at. But you can only do that if you're pulling them together to a central point. 
So here's a brief list. I mostly put this slide in because um, I'm going to stick the slides up on Sketch after the talk. And if anybody wants it, here's a list of what to monitor. There are a lot of other lists that you can find with a little bit of Googling. But you want to be aware of the usage of privileges and taking steps that could lead to failures that seem like things that you were not expecting. So let's talk about our, did I miss one there? Yeah, okay. So let's talk about our hypothetical cyber as a service company that Senator Hatch is providing. Um, in this case, they realized that some of the data that we're getting, some of the data that we gather could be considered confidential. And in some of the settings, maybe they're logging the tokens that were used to authenticate to the API. And they decide, you know what, actually we're just not gonna log that anymore, except in a critical debug case, so we'll drop that. But this other data that's specific to the company, we shouldn't be giving to the developers, so we're gonna put that in here, in a separate log that only operations can get to. And then we've got a log over here that has all of the data of how things are flowing, what's happening, and we can make that available to the developers. And they, are running modern Linux OSs, so they had to deal with systemd and pipe it into something else since systemd doesn't know how to send stuff off box. And in this case, they decided to use syslogng and pipe it into an elk stack. And then in their elk stack, they've got Grafana sitting on top of it so they can get some nicer graphs and they can pull in and they can do alerting off of what they're finding in elk. Um, they also set it up in an isolated network segment because the nice thing about using something like Grafana as a front end is they can have all the logging happen in an area that operations has access to is a network segment that ops has access to and is secure and then they can have a separate network segment for the stuff that they share with the devs that they can give them access to and so the devs can see Grafana and they can get access to the logs they're interested in but they can't get access to Elk on the back end without figuring out a way to break out of the network segment you've put them in. <clears throat> I, just, I didn't dig into that in this talk, but one of the critical components of designing the infrastructure is in designing the network so that it is segregated properly. And that should go right into the design of the components of the API uh, service itself. And then um, you want to instrument the API service as the developers are developing it. So they can go straight to a tool like Prometheus and then that can be displayed by Grafana. Prometheus can pull the stats that it exposes on the box, gather them together, and then the devs have full access to really seeing what the operation environment, the operating production environment is doing while things are in flight. Um, and so they, Hatch's company said, we're gonna run with this, we're gonna dig in, and they put all these steps in place. At the end of this process, they actually have, I mean, if you look at what's written out here, there are security components to this, but to a significant degree, this is just really useful for getting business done, for understanding how their software is working and how they can make it better. And that, that's one of the things that I wanted to underscore is doing this right is good for the company. It's going to put you in a better position to succeed and make progress. So let's talk a little bit about configuration management. Well, is there anybody else that wanted to add anything on that last slide, actually? Do you want to talk about monitors or logs? Any other components that we should, that you think would be useful to everybody else here? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It can, absolutely. And so the tool, the different tools that you've got, so ingesting them into Elk or even at the syslog level where you're aggregating it in the first place on the host where the web application is running, um, you, regex is your friend. I mean, you start identifying, you have some flags that are already in there of the information level that the dev decided it needed, whether it's an info, a debug, or whatever else type of parameter. Um, and you can use those to start to divide things up. I want, it, I want debug logs here, and I want warn logs here, and I want crit logs over here, and these are going to be accessible and these won't. But then you apply regexes on top of that that then say, 
here's where we pull out the things that you're looking for. But they can be. I mean, one of the one of the services that I've worked with recently had the rec- the number of log entries that they were getting is on the order of about 35 gigabyte. No, the main info log was hitting. Uh, between 76 and 105 gigabytes a day on the central log server. And that's, I mean, it's not the biggest thing there is out there, but all of that is one service doing one thing. And trying to parse through that, um, we had to put in place, okay, so here's here's what things should look like. And there you have the dialogue back with the devs, because that web app is your web app, most likely. And so you say, all right, guys, we need to be able to find this in the logs, just like you need to be able to find it once it's busy, so they can add, you know, recognizable lines that'll be unique for the particular flags or problems or alerts or whatever else you might be looking for. But, yes? Sure, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right. And one thing that's worth recognizing, and the reason we have two separate things here, is you've got logs and you've got statistics, which are different things, right? We're using Prometheus in order to gather simple stat data of what happened, how many things did you process, whatever else that are numerical and you really want graphs of. And then you have the log data where it's giving more verbose information, and you can generate graphs, fr- graphs from it after you regex out the right pieces that you want but it's going to be more verbose and it's intended more for troubleshooting and for identification of exactly what's going on. Thank you. This is what I wanted. Um, Let's move on. So let's talk about configuration management, code review, and change control. So um, most of the regs don't actually explicitly require that you use a configuration management system. They do require uniformity, though. Your auditors are going to come to you and say, I want you to show me these 10 machines, and I want these particular configs, and they expect them to all be the same or unique in intended ways. And if they see things in the configs that they have you pull while they're sitting there watching over your shoulder that are inconsistent or show ad hoc behavior on the particular host that you're looking at, then they, that's the stuff they look for, and then they go, oh, good. Let's see what we can do with that. Um, and dig deeper. And really, you don't, you, audits should be boring. The best kind of audit is a boring audit because, you know, exciting audits are, are not a good thing. <laughs> um, so, but configuration management is a great way to get there. Now, you know, 20 years ago, we all rolled our own. Everybody wrote some bash scripts and said, I'm going to have this happen on that server and this happen on that server. But really, nowadays, you've got great configuration management options. Right here in Salt Lake, we've got Salt Stack housed, and then you've got Ansible, you've got Puppet, you've got Chef, you can go back to CF Engine. Um, there's options that allow you to have a framework where you can draw on the community. I mean, open source is a great thing. There's nobody in this room. If you can prove me wrong on this statement, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm not going to believe you. But there's nobody in this room that does not use open source software on a regular basis. And what we gain there is a community, a synergy, as we each put effort in and we develop something that we can all use. And when it comes to configuration management, all of those solutions have modules and um, formulas or recipes that have been developed by others for the, for the problems you have. And you have the ability to implement or improve them if you need them. But it lets you lay your system down the way you want it. Um, I'm digging a little too deep on this slide. We'll keep moving. So code review, config management. Code review is also helped by configuration management systems. 
because you can do code review of what's going to happen on all the systems. Code review is something that has been established in development environments for a long time, but code review in operational environments is a big deal because that allows us to have that same kind of consistency. It allows us to have multiple eyes on. It allows us to build an architecture that we all agreed was the right architecture we wanted to build. Um, and you're going to have a lot, you get a higher level of effort as people know that somebody else is going to look at the crap that they wrote. And they're going to try a little bit harder to make it somewhat less crappy. And then you move forward to the last section of this, or last piece of this section, it's talking about change control. Change control is a word that I see many people who have worked in large environments, people who've been at the multinational, massive bureaucracies of doom, and you say change control, and they're like, no, because it means nothing can get done. I know, I worked with a guy who told me, yeah, when I was working for this healthcare company, what we would do is we'd kind of pile up several tickets of little things we needed to get done on a server, and then we'd wait for it to have an outage. As soon as that server had a problem, we'd get like 10 things done that we'd been waiting for that we could slam through on the outage because change control sucked. And so <laughs> that means change control's wrong in that environment. Change control is a way of enabling us to get things done in a safe way. And so if it's preventing us from getting things done, we're doing it wrong. So we'll talk a little bit about how we can do change control in a startup in a way that is still productive and helps us get stuff done. There we go. So let's talk briefly config management. I already talked a little bit about things like Puppet, Chef, Salt Stack, Ansible. It's a framework. There's modules available other people have already written for you. Um, it allows you to enforce consistency across the environment and to quickly change it. One, thing, one mistake that people often make is thinking of change control as a, um, or not change control, configuration management as a provisioning system. It is useful for provisioning, for getting something set up the way you want it in the first place, but it is also useful for enforcement and it should be run regularly to make sure that that environment stays the way you told it to stay. You can overwrite and change things that would be useful to an attacker or someone else alter later. Um, it also makes it really simple to review changes. And I would argue that containers still benefit from using configuration management inside of the container because you have the ability to tweak and make changes inside the container without completely having to deploy a new container. And you have the ability to enforce the container staying in a particular state. Um, if you're changing your containers really rapidly, maybe there's an argument to be made you shouldn't use configuration management, but I would argue that it's still worthwhile to have in there and connect back to the system. Um, and then at the beginning of a configuration management setup, you should plan for separation of secrets because sharing the configuration management setup with your developers, or, or it can be very helpful as they can see, oh, this is how the systems are set up in the production environment so that they can plan for that as they're doing development. They can see how you're laying down the config files for the software program that they gave you because you can share the config management system with them. And you have another set of eyes to be able to say, oh, you know what? This isn't working quite the way we intended it to because they know their product and they can look at how you've configured it with the config management. But in order to be able to do that, you have to plan from the get-go to separate secrets. You need to plan so that the data that you don't, they can't take out of the production environment, the data that can't go to the people who don't have production access is easily separated and hopefully encrypted. So if we talk about then code review and, then <clears throat> and change control environments, code review in systems like Garrett, GitHub, Crucible, Bitbucket are all solutions that allow you to say, hey, we need this many people to look at it, we need to approve it beforehand so that we know that we've all looked at it, and you're able to that way enforce best practices, enforce the architecture that you guys have decided you want in your environment. You can make sure that nobody's going in there and using three spaces instead of four, and that, the, that it looks pretty. Three spaces is just wrong, but... And it... it what? <laughs> Just, just tell your Vim to put spaces in when you tab. That's <laughs> um, so that way, everything gets reviewed and formally approved. And you have sign-off from multiple parties who've all taken responsibility for what is to happen here. 
Then as you move code review to change control, you're able to have a process where <clears throat> there is something for change control to review. Um, I've been in change control meetings where the person steps in and they're like, yeah, we're going to put this stuff on the server. Are you guys okay with that? <laughs> That's it. I mean, and, and there was no framework within the organization for it to be more detailed. There was no way for to easily communicate what was actually to be done. Code review provides us with that. And um, so then as we look at the, code, the change control also enforces the stages of progression of a new piece of, uh, of change. So it hasn't been tested in the development environment. Does everything look good? Are you guys comfortable with what you're seeing as you review the actual code? Great, now it's approved to go to staging. And in the staging environment, it runs. We have tests that we make sure we're validated. We record those in the ticket. And we say, okay, the tests have been run. It's successful. Did we have to make changes to it? Okay, we had to make some changes. Let's re-review for the changes. Or we say, all right, we didn't need any changes. It works exactly the way it was. We verified it. We put the verifications in. Great, we can approve it and move it on into production on some pre-approved time schedule. But change control allows us both to do the initial approval and then to validate that the process was followed and things move safely from one area to another. It does not have to be brutal and onerous. It does not require 10 people signing off from all branches of the company who have nothing to do with it but are mad at you because you didn't deploy their thing first. Instead, it can be a lean process that says, yep, we've looked at it, yep, we're safe, hey, everybody else checked it and checked off on it, and we can move forward. It can save us a tremendous amount of time in terms of downtime and production issues and reputation. So at Hatches Cyber as a Service Company, they decided to go with a change system. Hatch really wanted to use CF Engine because he heard about that back 15 years ago and he thought it was really cool. But the team managed to convince him that, you know what, let's, let's at least move as far forward as Puppet and we can use Vault so that our secrets can be stored encrypted and separate. And then they hatch also, you really want to use CVS, but they managed to convince him that Git was worthwhile. Um, and they chose to use Garrett and then deploy RT internally. One of the nice things about Garrett is that Garrett has really good enforcement of change control parameters um, and good logging of them. Then they define their process. Their process they came up with was you got to get one approval from another ops team member before you can deploy to staging. Somebody else has to have read your code. And then in the end, the change can iterate in staging, but if it changes in staging, it has to have a full re-review by another ops person before it can go to production. If it doesn't have to change in staging, then once it's been verified and passed the tests, we can move it on to production on the approved, the approved time schedule in the original ticket. So let's talk, I have got three minutes left for separation of duties, which is a bummer. Um, I'm gonna do this really fast. Separation of duties is teamwork, not isolation. Separation of duties should mean you do that job, I do this job, and we work together. If separation of duties means I don't talk to you anymore because you're in that other job, you're doing it wrong. Um, it defines responsibilities cleanly so that people have tasks they're responsible for, there's ownership, there's investment. Um, it, and, I mean, the obvious reason, separation of duties reduce, reduces risk of insider actions, whether it's malicious, rushed, or just incompetent. Um, and one thing to consider as you look at separation of duties is operations is not the job for your worst developer. You want people who do operations work. It's different than development work. And the two are complementary. Um, I'm, I'm bringing up the DevOps word really quick in that context because DevOps can be a description of the glue that holds separation of duties together. It's developers and operations working together and communicating well. It is not some developer that the development team got pushed through and given operations access so that he can do whatever he wants and bypass process and ignore change control and just get the things done the developers wanted to done, done that the operations team was taking too long to do. And it's not the operations guys saying, hey, we really wanted to write code because we want to be developers too, and coming up with some really crappy Perl script and saying we're DevOps. Um, everybody has to work together. 
Everybody needs to have clearly defined roles and they collaborate, which is what makes it DevOps. It's a team working together to achieve good work as a team. That's my definition, and there are plenty of people that will argue with me about it. If you guys want to, we'll save that one for after. Um, separation of duties in a lean startup. So you want to share as much as possible. I talked about this already, but I'm harping on it again because I think it's so important. Logs, configs, ticketing, and a production-like development environment all lead to a really good collaboration with the development team. The more the development can see into the operations environment, instead of operations trying to hunker down and hide because they're embarrassed or stressed or whatever, the better that relationship can be. But it is up to management as well to make sure that there is an equal relationship and the ops guys aren't just getting treated like lap dogs that should do whatever the dev team told them to do. It needs to be working together as equals, peers. And then planning from the beginning to make sure that secrets, config, that secrets are out of config management, that the logs are shareable, and that monitoring servers are shared. Everything's developed or forked in-house. Anything, this is worth just a second. Anything that gets developed or forked in-house now belongs to the house. It has to be maintained, just like your web API. Just like whatever other components you are owning that you built, you built that script. You built that piece of code that you so badly needed in-house. And usually that's a bad thing because then it sits and it atrophies. You need buy-in from management to support it. You need to be able to rely on the community, push it upstream. And I'm going to conclude on that because I'm out of time. So I'll put the slides up, but my argument would be that by implementing these few things, these four general categories that are common in regulated environments, you can make your startup more stable and more successful, as well as avoid a really embarrassing security incident. And that's it. If anybody has a last question, we don't really have any time, so come up and talk to me.